You're listening to Alamo City Limits Podcast with Noah Magaro George, the official San Antonio Spurs podcast of Pounding the Rock in SB Nation. What's going on, San Antonio Spurs fans? Welcome back to Alamo City Limits. I know that we have been on quite a long hiatus now. I was in Kansas for Christmas. I've been doing a lot of writing for Pounding the Rock, but we're back. It's been a month and You know what we're going to do today. We're going to be talking about your San Antonio Spurs. You're going to be joined by Damian Bartonek. He's been one of our favorite guests on this show. He's one of my favorite basketball minds. He's one of my favorite basketball writers. He writes here at Pounding the Rock alongside me. So how are you doing today, man? I'm doing well, man. I love that introduction. That's actually a great introduction. If I could like make that my Twitter header, uh, I actually would. <laughs> so uh, yeah, man, it's, <laughs> I'm excited to talk some Spurs hoops, and I'm glad to be back on the pod. So we got a lot to discuss, man. I'm just excited, bro. Let's do it. Yeah, me too. And I just want to let our listeners know we are recording this podcast on Wednesday, January 12th at about noon central time. We've got a ton of topics to talk about, like Damian just said. So let's go ahead and kick things off by discussing San Antonio's recent struggles. They have seen eight players enter health and safety protocols since Christmas. They are now one and seven over the last eight games. Were you at all surprised by how bad they were over this stretch? What did you see as their maybe their biggest issue? And then do you think they can recover from falling 10 games below 500 by the end of the season? Because that's where they're at right now. Yeah, so for me, I think... I wasn't very surprised with how bad they were. Now, I will say losing to the Pistons was a surprise, even with missing players. I believe DeJounte was the big one they missed for that game. I mean, that was that was pretty surprising that they lost that kind of ball game. Uh, but overall, since losing guys like, you know, Keldon Vassell, you know, Derek White, Doug McDermott, I was expecting them to kind of fall off a bit. I know back in one of your Twitter spaces when all this news kind of first broke and I wrote that 1,000-word preview for the Philly game and I had to, like, <laughs> rewrite the whole thing um, – Basically, I figured they were going to struggle. I know some people thought, like, hey, maybe the Spurs can still kind of win a game or two that maybe they shouldn't have despite losing all these players. But in my opinion, I figured they were going to struggle pretty pretty bad. I think just overall, uh, the shooting is, is what really... I'm a I'm a really big, like, I don't know, I, I hate to even say it, but, like, analytically, man, whether it's football, basketball, like, I love the three-point shot. I love, you know, getting three instead of two. I just love the deep ball. I love all that stuff. And um, I figured, man, if they're going to be, if it's going to be tough shooting nights ahead of them, they're going to struggle, especially especially against some pretty good teams. Whether it's Philly, Brooklyn, uh, doesn't matter what it is, they're going to struggle. So I was anticipating that. And as far as uh, you know, recovering, falling, you know, ten games below five hundred, and you know, all that good stuff. Well, bad stuff is not really good. But the Spurs right now, according to Tankathon, with the strength of schedule remaining, uh, they have the fifth toughest schedule. And honestly, I don't know how much they can recover. Because even if they when they, once they get those players back, if they're gonna play be playing a tough schedule that requires them to be you know be late in ball games, really playing tough games like that, they struggle in the clutch. I mean, I wrote that Philly preview, and up to that point, they had one of the lowest winning percentages. I believe they were at like thirty seven percent winning percentage in clutch time. So it's gonna be tough for them, man. I think it's a tough road ahead. I don't know if they're gonna recover. Uh, if I had to pick a you know pick a side, I'd say no. I think they're gonna stay relatively below five hundred by at least six seven games. Yeah, I I don't know if that's a bad analysis at all. I mean, I I think you're right when you say that they're probably going to stay below 500. I think they have a chance to stay in that playing range. Right now, it's super tight. You got teams like the New Orleans Pelicans, the Oklahoma City Thunder, the Sacramento Kings, the Minnesota Timberwolves. Like, all these teams in that playing range, they're separated by, like, three games. The Spurs go on, like, a four-game heater. Those guys lose, like, two or three games. All of a sudden, you're the ninth seed. All of a sudden, you're the eighth (laughs) seed. All of a sudden, you're the seventh seed. Like, even the Los Angeles Clippers, who... They've been playing without Paul George. Once he comes back, I think they'll be a little bit better. But even they have fallen out of the playoffs. Like, they are in that playing range now. They are the ninth seed in the Western Conference. So, looking at the schedule for the Spurs, I think it's going to be really tough for them, especially considering I think they still have the, and what is it? I think it's an eight game rodeo road trip yep. in February, right? Yep. And they're only eight and 15 outside of the AT&T Center. I know a lot of that has to do with them missing DeJounte. They missed Keldon, Devin. You know, they, they missed a ton of guys. I get that. But even when they had those guys, they still had a losing record on the road. And I'm just not that convinced that they're going to just turn it around magically. Right. I think they had a lot of guys who were on unbelievably hot streaks. Like Keldon Johnson was shooting 60 percent from three for 20 games. That's not going to happen. We saw him starting to cool off before he entered health and safety protocols. That's not going to happen. He's not going to be that good from three all season. And even if he was, his type of three-point shooting, it's mostly standstill, stationary, catch-and-shoot. 
it's not as valuable as somebody like a Vassell or a McDermott who, you know, they're shooting off the move. And they've been pretty good from three this season. But overall, I'm not really buying into the Spurs. And when I look at what they did when they were losing, you know, one and seven over their last eight games, like I mentioned, really, to me, they should be 0 and 8. They had five turnovers in the last minute, not the the last five minutes, not the last 10 minutes, not the fourth quarter, the last minute of that Boston Celtics game, five turnovers. And the Boston Celtics did not score once off of those five. Now, credit to Derek White and DeJounte Murray and some of the other guys who really stifled them in transition. But that last turnover in particular, you see Jock Landale, he's inserted the game to inbound the ball. There's just this bizarre blunder that happens where he passes it directly to Jalen Brown. He goes the other way. It looks like he's going to put up that game-winning layup as the buzzer's going off, and it just sort of rolls off the rim. And you know what? Like Again, credit the Spurs for sticking in and and hanging in there tough, but they should have lost that game. There's no reason other than you know the sheer will and maybe a little bit of good luck that they didn't lose that game. But we'll see. They are getting guys back. They have some, uh, at least a relatively easy schedule over their next couple of games. So I think, especially tonight, like they're, they're going to be playing the Houston Rockets tonight. That's a good building block. I know that not everybody's going to be healthy, but, you know, it's, it's not the end of the world for the Spurs. I don't think they're as bad or as good as a lot of people expected them to be. They're a young team. They're inconsistent. And I think that's exactly, you know, we've gotten exactly what we thought we would out of them. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think for me, I mean, me and you both said it, you know, before the season, you know, on Twitter, whether it was between one another, just anything. We figured this team was going to be kind of in this below 500 range kind of fringe play in team. And that's kind of where they are right now. Well, that kind of that's where they are. You know what I mean? And, you know, over these, you know, the re- remaining schedule, they're going to play Golden State three times. They're going to play Phoenix twice. They're going to play the Bulls twice, the Grizzlies three times. So like you mentioned, right, they turned the ball over five times in the last minute. They do that against those teams. They ain't, they ain't coming out with the win. That's for sure. I don't, they, yeah, you're yeah, done. And, you're done. You're losing and, those and games. You're losing it too, those like, games. They do, like you mentioned, they play the Rockets tonight. They play the Rockets four times over the remaining schedule, the Thunder three times, the Pelicans three times. So they have some easy games mixed in. But it seems like right now, from a, you know, from this kind of point of view, they either play a really good team or a really bad team over this next stretch of games for the remainder of the year. So... I'm going to be really excited to see how this team does, but yeah, I'm just not anticipating them, you know, really significantly improving even when they get those guys back because the schedule's tough. They're a, they're a team that struggles in the clutch. They're a young team that doesn't do well on the road. Uh, it's there's a lot of signs pointing in the opposite direction. So, uh, not to be you know the, the the bad news guy over here, but it's going to be kind of tough in my opinion. Yeah, I don't even know what expectations I should really have for the San Antonio Spurs. Like they've they've been all over the place, which again, like they're a young team and consistency is sort of a hallmark of young teams. But l- let's be honest, I mean, they beat the Jazz on the road, like fully healthy Jazz team on the road, fully healthy Golden State Warriors team on the road. They've beat the Lakers by a ton. You know, granted, they they weren't fully healthy. But then they lost to the Hornets, who, like, they didn't have LaMelo. They didn't have Terry Rozier. They didn't have Ish Smith. They didn't have Cody Zell. They didn't have, like, most of their starters. And they lost by, like, almost 30 to that team. They also lost by almost 30 to the Sacramento Kings when the Sacramento Kings didn't have De'Aaron Fox or, like, I think two other members of their starting lineup. So I don't know what to expect from them. So when I say, okay, well, tonight's a good building block, it could be. But they could also somehow lose... To the Houston Rockets like they yeah. lost to the Pistons I, I, I don't understand I know fans were quick to say okay well you're missing Doug and you're missing Lonnie and you're missing Dev like you're missing six guys I get it they're all rotational guys the Pistons were missing 13 players yeah. from their 17 man roster they had eight guys signed to 10 day contracts I don't yeah. care who you're putting out there if you have at least half of your roster when the other team is fielding eight 10 day contract guys no reason it should go to overtime no reason it should you know, come down to the wire, anything like that. That should be a straight up win. Obviously, there's variance in the NBA. Anybody can, you know, go off on any given night, even these guys on 10 day contracts. But realistically, the Spurs should have won that game. And so, for that reason, just looking at their inconsistency, I don't know what to expect. I really don't. Like, they, they could end up surprising me, and they have, like, in, in several ways, and we can talk about that. So, what are some of the ways <laughs> that this team has surprised you through the first 40 games of the season? I think the fact that they play just about every game really, really tight, really, really close. uh, And it's surprising to me because 
you know, I believe up until a few games ago, like their net rating, they were on the positive side of net rating, which I was like, hey, that's not, you know, that's that's a that's a step in the right direction, right? I think just how well they play together, um, albeit that they're not like a great team, but this team relatively meshes well, and they are limited in some really crucial areas, and for the modern NBA especially. But I'm just surprised at the fact that they've played up to the standard they they're in the play in despite the fact that they are still in my in my eyes even though the stats may say they're kind of middle of the pack I still think they're really limited just to the eye when I watch them I I I think that's what I'm most impressed with just how well they play together and how they play up to competition and now they have played down to competition a few times but they've also played up to competition so I think I'm just kind of I'm just surprised or impressed rather with just the makeup of this team and how hard they they play. I think that's something we can all agree on. Yeah, I don't know that I'm super surprised that they've hung tough with a lot of teams. I think, like, looking at their personnel, I thought that they were just not good enough as a group to be really good. But, like, the way that Popovich has them out there where they're moving the ball a lot, they're not, you know, committing a lot of turnovers, uh, they're taking smarter shots than they were a year ago. You know, they've taken a lot of those mid-range shots out of their diet, added it at the rim and the paint from beyond the arc like I'm not super surprised by that but what I am surprised by is they have a lot of limited offensive players but they have the 10th best offense in the league like 110 and a half points per game they're number 10 in field goal percentage they've made the most field goals in the NBA they're 13th in three point percentage they're top of the league in assists per game they're one of the best rebound like that is not what I expected at the beginning of the season when I did my season preview I said look this team is going to struggle on offense it's going to be a pedestrian half-court offense, but they're going to stick in games with their defense. You go on the other side of the ball, they have been one of the worst teams on the defensive end all season. Of course, we see stretches where, like, specifically against the Celtics. Like, they held them to, I think, like, four or so points over the last five minutes of that game, which is one of the reasons that they ended up winning that game. Uh, you look at that game that they played recently. I'm trying to think who it was against. I believe it was against the Nets. They didn't let them score over the last five minutes and 46 seconds of that game. So, like, clearly we know that they have the personnel and guys like DeJounte and Devin and Derek and Jakob to be elite for small stretches. But I thought it would kind of translate throughout the season in that they would be a top 10 defense. They haven't been. They've been one of the worst defenses. So those are two things that have surprised me just because it just flip-flopped in a way that I didn't expect. Because let's be honest, like DeJounte Murray has been very good this season, but he's not an elite offensive engine. And you look at the other players he's working with, they're not scrubs or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not trying to imply that they are bad, but like Keldon Johnson is very limited. Derek White is very limited. Yaka Pirtle is incredibly limited. Doug McDermott, for all that he can do off ball and as a three-point shooter, he's a specialist. Like he's limited. And the fact that they're just so good at offense or at least, you know, offensive rating points per game over the stretch like it, it's just it's just strange it, it, it is just such a strange thing to me and I, I don't know if that surprised you at all but for me I don't even know what to make of it really yeah so whenever I wrote that piece again about Philly earlier that I mentioned uh the Philly preview the Spurs half court offense whenever I went on cleaning the glass back then about last week was they were kind of I think they were 16th in half court offense which like if you would have told me that prior to the season I would have taken that I would have been like, that's actually really solid considering, you know, the personnel who they have. Like, I think you live with that. So I would agree with that as well. That's actually a great point and something that I really feel is is something that I kind of overlooked a little bit was just how well they've kind of improved or kind of stayed at this level throughout the year. Because, yeah, if you would have told me this coming into this season, that's where the Spurs rank, I think you got to be happy with it. I mean, and they are, like you mentioned, they are very limited in some key aspects of modern NBA offense that you need from certain players, and they just don't have it. So uh, I think you have to be happy with that. They have been, you know, surprising in some key areas, and I think all in all this year, regardless how it ends, I think you have to be happy with, you know, how the, how the years went for them. Yeah, I have been that mostly... That might be a hot take, actually, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm proud of what they've been able to do given their roster, and like, one of the other things I didn't mention, but like even without DeJounte and all these other guys in health and safety protocol, they've still maintained that top 10 offensive rating, which like before it was like number six or number seven, you look over the month of December, which we can talk about that very briefly because we have not really had a podcast for like the last month. But December, the Spurs were actually really good. They had the number two offense in the NBA over the month of December, only to the Utah Jazz. And like the end of the month, they didn't have DeJounte Murray for like the last four games of the month. I know that's only four games out of about 12, but 
I mean, that's pretty impressive in and of itself, even without these other players. I know that they've lost a lot of games, but they've still scored a lot. Granted, it's been against like the Pistons and the Raptors. Uh, but I mean, even against the Nets, I know it went to overtime, so it gave a, a, a few more minutes for them to play, but they still dropped 119 on the Nets, who probably a lot of people don't realize this, but they're not great at offense this year. But the Nets have been a lead on the defensive end. So the fact that San Antonio was able to do that shorthanded against a, a Nets team that was mostly healthy, that's pretty impressive. So, again, not really sure why that's the case other than the, the Spurs are doing everything that Pop has asked them. You know, they're, they're following the rules of that motion offense. They're not taking silly shots. They're not, um, you know, nobody's playing hero ball. DeJounte Murray has the most isolation possessions on the team. But doesn't really matter. The Spurs rank dead last in ISO possessions in the NBA. So... The only thing I can think of for defensive wise, why they've been so bad is their lack of defenders that are about that like six, eight, six, nine ish forward range, which is funny because everybody wanted Rudy Gay gone, including myself, right? Like not because I don't like him <laughs> because it was time to move on, but they could really use like a Rudy Gay sized defender and a guy who can kind of shoot the three ball. And I know that Rudy Gay last season, a lot of times he was used at the end of shot clocks to bail them out. He took some really awkward mid range jumpers. He wasn't as efficient, but Man, they could really use a guy like Rudy Gay this season, <laughs> and hopefully they find that guy in the draft. We can save that for another podcast, but let's go ahead and talk about DeJounte Murray. We've brought him up a few times. Yeah, The San Antonio Spurs, man, they have been campaigning hard for him to get into that all-star game on their social media. I mean, it's been everywhere. They've done it on Twitter. They've done it on Facebook. They've done it on Instagram, and it's all day, every day, hashtag DeJounte Murray, hashtag all-star. And we've talked about it, I know, uh, more than a few times on here. But opinions can change. He's had a lot of things that could change our opinion. Has your opinion changed? Does he belong in the All-Star game this season? And at the very least, should he be considered as an All-Star alternate? Yeah, so I want to close really quick on what you mentioned earlier about, you know, just the Spurs offense too. I think I'll be that person as well. You got to give credit to Coach Pop and the staff, man. I mean, you really do. When you look at it, in my opinion, as an offense, this 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 team is very limited. Like we mentioned a hundred times, with you know specific players, for them to rank this high, I think that's credit to the to the staff. I mean, I know everyone's upset with this down the third about where Pop what Pop's done and everything like that, but in my opinion, to manufacture this offense to really make every every possession, it seems like they're playing their their players to the you know to their strengths rather than their weaknesses. They're really asking them to you know really excel within the comfort of their game. I think you really have to give credit to that staff. So, yeah, I know I'm 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 the I'm the coach pop Mark over here. I'm the coach pop you know Homer, but uh, <laughs> no, in my opinion, I think that's that's a huge credit to what they've been able to do. So that's that on that. As far as Dejounte Murray consideration, yes, I think he should be considered. But do I think he's going to make it or that he should make it over some other players? Uh, no, no, I don't. Whether that's you know a John Morant or you know a Steph Curry or whomever is in is in that upper upper tier of guys, no, I don't see him making it over those guys. I just think it's not because he's not that good or I'm saying anything like that. But we just have to call a spade a spade here sometimes. I mean, let's just you know hypothetically, right? Donovan Mitchell, uh, Steph Curry, you know John Morant, you know those guys are going to be you know locks to get in. Luka Doncic locked to get in. I I'm honestly a, a part of me thinks that they're going to put Russell Westbrook in just because he's Russell Westbrook. Oh man! But I don't think he should. Right? None of us do. No. Yeah. But you but, but you know it's coming. Like you know it's coming. You know what I mean? I, I think those kind of those kind of things those players are going to get in. And it's really tough for me to see you know Dejounte Murray making it, even though it's not his fault. The team you know not really having a ton of success unless you're a superstar normally players like that don't get in you know what I mean so I think he should be considered but I don't think he'll make it no I, I don't think he'll make it either I think he could be considered as like one of the all-star backups right like if he squeezed into the game it's as a backup it's not as a starter um, and, and I just wanted to clarify some things for some fans I've seen a lot of fans on Twitter just basically on social media in general be really upset at how the the voting structure works and I don't actually think they realize how it works because I keep hearing people call it a popularity contest. A popularity contest this, a popularity contest that. That's not what it is. Fan voting only counts for 25% or 50% rather of the entire vote. So like a fan vote is not going to get a player in by default. And we're only voting for starters. So fan vote is 50%. They have a panel of media that counts as 25%, and they have a panel of all active players that is the other 25%. And the guys who are going to start this game, 
they absolutely deserve to start this game. There's only going to be two backcourt starters. That's probably going to be Steph Curry. It might be Devin Booker. It might be John Morant. And it could be Donovan Mitchell. It could even be a guy like Luka Doncic. All of those guys would deserve to start ahead of DeJounte Murray. That's not hating. It's just a fact. So we're looking at the backups. That's his best chance to get in the game, right? Well, the backups, they're selected by a panel of all the head coaches in the NBA. And if I'm a head coach in the NBA, for me, there's no reason to pick a guy like Russell Westbrook. I know that he's garnered a lot of respect, but even you know head coaches can probably realize like that guy doesn't belong. I think DeJounte Murray is in the discussion, but even with all those guys that we just mentioned who could be starters, there's going to be guys who aren't going to be able to be starters. There are only two spots, right? And generally, there's only six backcourt spots for each conference. So we already mentioned a plethora of guys who deserve that. They absolutely deserve that. And it's not DeJounte's fault. He has been fantastic this season, but they definitely deserve it over him. So even if you say, let's say Luka starts, Steph starts, that means you've got Chris Paul, Donovan Mitchell, John Morant, and Devin Booker as the other four. Like, that's not a question. I know that some people want to look at numbers and go, well, but DeJounte has almost as many assists and it's more points and it's more rebounds than Chris Paul, but the Suns are one of the best teams in the NBA. Spurs are fighting off being one of the worst teams in the NBA. That's that's just a fact. And like you could say, well, what if you switched one with the other? Like would the Suns be even better? It doesn't matter. You can't work in hypotheticals like that. We can look at the facts. We can look at what these teams and where they stand right now. And we can look at DeJounte. So I think we should look at some of his stats this season and, and sort of dissect it a little bit because while I think he absolutely deserves to be in consideration, and if they change the format where you know they got rid of positions, they got rid of conferences, I think he makes the team and I think he deserves to make the team. But let's take a look at some of his numbers. Is there anything in particular that stands out to you about DeJounte's numbers? Uh, I think for me, I actually want to kick it back to you because you have some really interesting things that you talked to me about before we got on uh, on this pod. And now I assumed coming into this year and kind of where DeJounte stands that obviously a lot of what he's doing, you know, he has a lot more volume, a lot more touches, stuff like that. So I get that, right? I get the increase in all these numbers and I'm fine with it. But I really want to hear those numbers again because I think that will add some, well, some much needed context to some things that we've said, you know, in podcasts before. Sure. Yeah, so... I'll go ahead and run through this exercise again with you real quick. I think it's it's interesting. Yeah. This is not to yeah. hate on DeJounte yeah. Murray. Uh, disclo- like full disclaimer or whatever here. I think he absolutely has made progress from a year ago. But I think it's important for people who maybe aren't watching the game as in depth or maybe they're more casual. You know, they just tune into the games and they look at the stat sheets and they look at some of the numbers and they go, well, that's an all-star. I think when you look at what DeJounte Murray has done, Right, and more points per game, more rebounds per game, more assists per game. And that's great. Like, that is progress. That is absolutely progress. But I think you have to absolutely take into account the amount of opportunity that has been presented to him now that DeMar DeRozan is gone, Rudy Gay is gone, Patty Mills is gone. So I'll ask you this question Out of all the players in the NBA, and there have been more than 530 players who have suited up in the NBA this season. Where do you think DeJounte Murray ranks in terms of touches per game? I would say, like, top 20. That's what I would think. Right? That, that, feels, that feels like a realistic range, but you would be wrong. He's not top 20, and it's not because he's outside of the top 20. In <laughs> fact, he's inside the top 20. He's inside the top 10. He is number 7 in the NBA in touches per game. He's almost identical amount of touches per game to a guy like Trey Young, LaMelo Ball, both who have about 86 touches per game. Now you look at the guys in front of him, Nikola Jokic, James Harden, Luka Doncic, LeBron James, Trey Young, as we mentioned, LaMelo Ball, as we mentioned. I think every single one of those guys, you could argue, is a better playmaker. I don't care if you're looking at just assists per game. We know what DeJounte Murray thrives off of, and that's okay. He can thrive off of basic reads. He's hitting those pocket passes. He's finding guys from one pass away. He's not making mistakes. He's very cautious. He reminds me of Chris Paul at times. Like Chris Paul is a phenomenal, you know, passer, but he can be a little overcautious at times. And I think DeJounte Murray takes that to almost another level, which isn't a bad thing. Being cautious is great. You're not turning the ball over. You're not giving the other uh, you know, team an opportunity to go the other way for a couple of points. But I think when you look at assists, we've talked about it before. 
They're not all created equally. He's not a guy who takes a lot of risks. He's not a guy who really passes his teammates open. He just finds the open man, spurs motion offense, a lot of screening, a lot of cutting. And so he does what he does well, and that's okay. But I just can't help but look at that 85.6 touches per game and say, you know, that is not heavily responsible for an uptick in assists per game and points per game because when you have that much more opportunity than they do a year ago and he ranked in the top 70 in touches per game a year ago, you're go- the points are going to come. The assists are going to come. The rebounds are going to come. So that's one of the things that stands out for me in particular. We can talk about rebounding. So I think he is one of the best rebounders in the NBA for a point guard. Like that's not debatable. He absolutely is. But the one thing that I will throw out there is for all the people who year in and year out say, you know, Russell Westbrook, it's stat padding. You know, he's just getting all those rebounds because his teammates box out for him. Oh, he's stealing rebounds for his teammates. I just don't know that you can't say the same thing about DeJounte Murray if you were going to say that about Russell Westbrook. I don't think either thing is true because I think that simplifies it in a way that is unfair to both players. But you look at the top 50 rebounders in the NBA right now. DeJounte Murray is almost right in the middle. He's 27th. He has the fewest contested rebounds in the NBA, and that's right next to a guy like Russell Westbrook and Jason Tatum. That doesn't mean they're not good rebounders, but like we mentioned before this podcast started, we talked about it off air, teams will scheme to get the ball into their ball handler's hands, right? They're going to do that. So guys like Keldon Johnson, guys like Yaka Pirtle, they're going to box out hard to give DeJounte Murray an opportunity to get rebounds on the defensive end so that he can immediately start the offense. They don't have to worry about passing it to him. He can push the pace. We know that the Spurs love to push the pace. They're top five in pace in the NBA this season. So if you're going to argue that Russell Westbrook's stats are empty, then you got to argue the same thing for DeJounte. And again, I don't believe that's true for either of those players. I think it has been oversimplified. But if you're going to make an argument for Russ, you got to make it for DeJounte. So I think you look at his rebounding, you look at the assist, you look at the points, those things, like I mentioned, were always going to come with more opportunity. And DeJounte, to his credit, has done a lot with that opportunity. And I'm happy for him. But I still don't think that puts him in the same echelon as guys like, uh, you know, Donovan Mitchell or Nikola Jokic or James Harden or Luka Doncic. They, they just aren't. Like, you watch the tape, you watch the games. They're not the same player. They just yeah. they don't have the same impact. Yeah, and another thing, too, is like it's not necessarily even a bad thing that they manufacture touches for him or they kind of simplify things for him for him to get the ball in his hands. Like I, I was telling Noah, like every sport across America does that. In football, the, the first 15, 20 plays of an offense are normally st- uh, scripted, and they you get a lot of manufactured throws to your best players or whatever the case may be, get some easy throws for your quarterback. And the same thing here. You know, like they're going to do that for DeJounte Murray. They're going to do that for their best player. So while we're not saying like, oh, that's the only reason why he's doing better or he's putting up better numbers. No, he's improved. Like Noah mentioned the pocket pass. Two seasons ago, DeJounte couldn't make that. Watch watch one of those first Thunder games in 2019 uh, when the Thunder played the Spurs. He would would attempt it, and it was a a turnover more times than not. Like, yeah, he's improved now. Like, let's call a spade a spade. But at the same time, like I just mentioned, some of it is just because of an uptick in touches or what they're doing, you know, to get him the ball. So... It's not a bad thing. It's not like we're saying this is all, that's the only reason why he's doing better. But at the same time, you kind of got to just look at the context like we've been mentioning you know, numerous times throughout this show. Yeah, and I love DeJounte Murray. Like, I think that the fact that he's been able to up his touches by such a drastic amount and there hasn't been an equally drastic drop-off in his efficiency, that's telling. Like, usually when guys receive that much more opportunity with a relatively similar supporting cast— their efficiency doesn't go up or maintain. It usually drops off a cliff. Like, that's really, yep. really hard to do. The fact that he shot 45% last year as the second option, and he's only dropped down to 44% as the number one undisputed top option for the Spurs, that's impressive. Like, he deserves all the credit in the world for that. He's become a marginally better three-point shooter this season. We've seen him knock down some threes off the dribble, and I think that's the next progression for him. For him to take the next step as a scorer, and even as a playmaker, like just being able to knock threes down off the dribble, that opens up so much as a scorer, as a passer. And I think DeJounte Murray still has some stuff to uncover. Like I think his potential hasn't been reached yet. I think where I thought he was, okay, this is who he is, kind of, that was, I was wrong. I'm willing to eat crow on that. 
I am 100% willing to say I was wrong because we look at DeJounte every single season, he's added something new, whether it's the pocket pass, whether it's the mid-range jumper, he's become one of the best finishers in the NBA at the rim this year. Like, let me ask you, where do you think he ranks in terms of finishing at the rim or what percentage of, of, of his shots do you think he finishes at the rim? Um, let me, let me, let me see. So I know before the, before the year or last year, I believe he was in, he was around like 50, 52%, wasn't he? Or 55% wasn't he somewhere was somewhere around He there? was 63 last 63? season after okay, okay. being 56 the season before. Okay. Okay. Uh, I would say it's somewhere in the sixties. Yeah. He's almost 68% finisher at the rim. That's only a few percentage points below Jakob Pertl, who is one of the best finishers at the rim in the NBA. So DeJounte Murray, again, he's added something new to his bag every single season. And hopefully this progression continues to happen. Like, I love DeJounte Murray. I don't know if he'll make the All-Star team this year. But he has a good chance to make the All-Star team if the Spurs improve. And if they get that Tier 1 talent if they add some more pieces around him that make his job easier so that he doesn't have as many responsibilities, everything's simplified. I really think he could make an all-star team. I think he is deserving of all-star consideration this year. We'll see where it ends up, but I just wanted to end this on a positive note because I know we've said, okay, well, DeJounte Murray did this, but let's look at that. Or DeJounte Murray has improved, but it's because of this, but he deserves credit. Like he absolutely sure. has improved from a year ago, more rebounds, more assists, more steals, like, he has carried the, the Spurs, really, on both ends. Like, he isn't the defensive anchor that Jakob Pertl is, but he's, you know, it's pretty undeniable at this point. He's one of the best perimeter defenders. He's blowing up those dribble handoffs. He's picking off lazy passes. He's getting his hands on these guys who, you know, their, their handle isn't great, and he's making them pay for it. So the fact that he leads the league in deflections and, and steals per game, if that maintains, he would be only the second player in NBA history to do that outside of Paul George. So... You know, DeJounte Murray deserves credit. He's in the all-star discussion, but just not quite there. But maybe he gets there. You know, maybe he gets there in the next couple of seasons. Now, a guy who we're hoping gets to at least somewhere special in the next couple of seasons because it could change the Spurs' outlook pretty quickly is Josh Primo. We all know you love Josh Primo. I really like Josh Primo. I was a little skeptical at the beginning. I had a lot of reasons to be skeptical, I think. You know, so did the fan base. But we've all sort of warmed up to Josh Primo. And he's getting a chance to play real minutes. Now, let me ask you, what, what have you seen from him over these probably last eight or nine games? And specifically over these last three games that he started for the San Antonio Spurs. So I think for me, the like the one thing that I always mentioned was just kind of comfort, how he looks out there. Because, uh, you know, a lot of times young players, when you throw them into the fire like that, especially when they're playing, you know, 25, 39, 27 minutes like he's been playing over these last three games, you know, you could see it kind of go bad pretty quickly. Uh, for him, though, he's really poised. He's really conf confident, really comfortable uh, whenever he's out there. And I think that's one thing I really want to kind of go into a little bit more depth about. So against Brooklyn, right, he has a really rough shooting night. Really, really rough. Really, really rough shooting day. Then he's late in game. They kick it out to him. He stands in the pocket, hits a wide open, or hits a wide open catch and shoot three. That's a big shot that you want to see a young player take and make with confidence. And it was cash. It, it, it was like he was he was out there shooting by himself. So I think one thing that I really really saw, one thing that I really liked, was just the overall comfort and the feel that he has for the game. He's really confident, and really comfortable when he's out there. And like we mentioned, the Spurs offense does a lot. Of, you know, you know, a lot of manufacturing for you know their players. They kind of play them to their strengths, especially offensively. And he really fits into what they like to do. But this, hopefully, this is not all that they want him to do. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want Josh Primo to be the catch-and-shoot player for his whole entire career. I think there's off-the-dribble creation, and I think we saw that. Like, against the Knicks, for example, he had a couple of really good dimes to KBD. Uh, I think that was actually his best game over this entire stretch as well was against the Knicks. So... I really liked what I've seen from him. Obviously, I'm not saying this dude's going to be Luka Doncic or anything like that. But what I am saying is he's definitely shown a lot of positive signs. He's shown a lot that you'd like to see from young players. And I think that if the Spurs can really just be patient with this guy, really give him some, you know, as, as many touches as you can get him, whether it's in the G League or at the next level, whatever you want to do to really be patient and really just kind of get this guy up to speed, I really am excited to see him in year three, specifically year three. Year two, I'm expecting some more developmental stuff. But year three, I think we could really see this kid start to take off. No, I agree with you. I really like what he's been able to do, not necessarily from like an efficiency standpoint or not turning the ball over or anything like that because he has made mistakes. He has taken some bad shots. He has been shaky as a shooter, as a finisher at the rim. 
but just his poise. You really like his poise and the fact that he's doing this. You know, he he is the youngest starter in San Antonio Spurs franchise history. And I know, like, maybe that doesn't mean to a, a lot to to some people, but to me, it does. You know, like Tony Parker was the was the previous holder of that record, and age is not necessarily an asset. But the fact that he is this poised, that like you mentioned, like he was willing to just knock down that shot after having a poor shooting night. Like it takes a lot of guts to be able to do that, a lot of confidence to be able to do that. And the number one thing that I've noticed is regardless if he shoots the ball well, if he commits a turnover, if he makes a mistake, like his head his head is high. Like he holds his head high. He doesn't get down on himself. And that being said, you know, I, I think he probably needs to go back to the G League. And let's let's talk about that. So would you rather see him stick with the San Antonio Spurs for the rest of the season and be entrenched in, in this uh, rotation? Or do you think maybe he he needs to go back to the G League? Because I think I'm leaning towards him, you know, spending more time with the Austin Spurs. I just can't help but feel like that on-ball development without all the pressure of not making mistakes because the Spurs are still trying to win. I think that's more beneficial, but I'd love to get your opinion on that. Yeah, no, no, no. I want him. I want him back in Austin. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I like I like I mentioned whenever I was you know discussing his play. Uh, this is not what I believe Josh Primo is or what he needs to be. Uh, I think there's more upside here. There's more potential there. So I don't think making him in this kind of this one role and kind of more of like a specialist, like we were mentioning with Doug McDermott, kind of making him him as just a primary catch and shoot guy. I don't think they need that. I mean, and someone we'll talk about later, I'm sure, like Lonnie Walker. Like if they want someone that can be a catch and shoot <laughs> guy, Lonnie Walker could be that guy. You know, Doug, you don't need to make Josh Primo into that kind of player. So I agree with you, Noah. I think, yeah, get, get him over there in Austin. You know, get him those those on ball reps, and uh, just kind of let him work, man. Let him work without having to worry about the consequences. Absolutely, and he only averaged ten point seven points, one point seven rebounds, and two point seven assists on thirty seven, thirty six, seventy five shooting splits as a starter. So it's not like he was that impressive. But one of the things that really stood out to me was his defense. Because I remember John Hollinger pointing out in one of the first games that he played against the Wizards that he was just all sorts of turned around. Like, people were backdoor cutting him. He was losing guys off ball. Like, he just was sort of out of sorts out there. And over this last stretch of probably eight or nine games, I think he's looked really good defensively. He's looked better as a team defender. He's commuting, communicating well with his teammates. And, and one of the things that is most impressive to me is he's shown a knack for not just blocking shots and, and getting his you know hands on ball and using his length to disrupt plays, but he's drawn charges like he's Derek White out there. I mean, he's willing to lay his body on the line, and he kind of looks like Derek White light on the defensive end. Like, he is blocking shots with verticality. He's not committing a lot of fouls. He's disrupt, disrupting plays with his length. Like, I, I just really like what I've seen from him on the defensive end, and if he can become a two-way asset like Derek White, like a DeJounte Murray, that's huge for the Spurs because I don't know that that was something that they were necessarily counting on. Like, looking at his numbers at Alabama, I believe he only had, uh, I think think it was like seven blocks or something like that, like pretty low his entire season at Alabama, already has more than that in the NBA, in the G League. Like, that's impressive, and that's something that is really encouraging if you're a Spurs fan, that he can be a two-way contributor, because we know what one-way contributors can do. And it's nice to have a guy who's a one-way contributor, but I don't think we anticipate him being a Luka or even like a, a Damian Lillard or a Chris Paul, like he's not probably going to have that big of an offensive impact. But if he can be a guy who develops into like a borderline all-star offensive talent and provide two-way impact, like that's huge. That's really, really huge. So looking forward to see how he develops over the next couple of seasons. Now, one guy who we've watched develop in San Antonio for the last four years now is Lonnie Walker. And I don't think we have any more clarification on his situation going forward than we did at the beginning of the year. I know he's had some hot streaks. He's had some really off games. Where do you think he stands with San Antonio? Like, where does his future lie? Is it with the Spurs? Is is he going to get an extension? Are they re-signing him? Or do they let him walk? Like, I I just don't know. So let me get your take on that. So I think this has been, he has been one of the most interesting players to watch, I believe, this year, especially coming into the year. Because it seems like Spurs fans and even some Spurs media out there really believe that Man, this guy has a lot to, to work with. There's a there's a lot to kind of tap in here. If only he can put it together, right? I think I've said that a million times on this show, right? Uh, right now, though, I, I don't think I think the only way you resign him is if it's a team friendly deal. And why would he take that? You know what I mean? Like, why would he take a, a, a two year ten ten million dollar deal, two year twelve million dollar deal? 
Um, shout out to you know Spurs prominent Spurs you know Twitter guy Eric Salinas, really cool <laughs> dude. Uh, he put on Twitter straight up like, "What is Lonnie's deal going to look like, right? If he was resigned?" And um, you know, I got a, I, I responded and I got some love from some uh, Spurs Twitter folks. Shout out to y'all. Where I basically said, so he mentioned Kyle Anderson. So Kyle Anderson got four years, thirty-seven million dollars. In my opinion, if Lonnie gets that kind of deal, he he and his agent need to run towards that, uh, because right now he hasn't shown any sort of consistency, in my opinion, to really warrant a a long, not only a long-term uh, commitment from a team, but a nine to ten year, a nine to ten million dollar kind of deal. I I just don't see how you pay someone like that when like like we're gonna probably talk about here. The shooting has has regressed. Just about everything, you know, on the offensive end, in my opinion, regressed. Uh, regressed. I think the one thing we all wanted to see him do is kind of carve out a role, something that you know he can really kind of go to as his bread and butter. And it's kind of for me, I don't really see that either. Uh, I know, you know, last year he was really good shooting off the catch. He shot nearly thirty nine percent on catch and shoot threes. This year he's at thirty four percent, and it just seems like I don't know if it's a confidence thing. No, I know you know more than me, so I don't know if it's a confidence thing, brother. I don't know if it is a a feel, a comfort. But one thing uh, before I kick it to you that I want to kind of throw out there as well is I wonder how teams are going to look at you know his situation because if you're struggling in San Antonio, a place where we've mentioned really does a lot for their players in terms of kind of giving them some easy looks, kind of really playing them to their strengths. I don't. I can't imagine him going to another situation that could do that you know, even more beneficial to him, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? That can really benefit him more than what the Spurs system could do. So with that being said, I'd like to kick it to you and just, yeah, let me know if I'm dumb. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. No, no, man. I, I respect your opinion. Honestly, I respect almost everybody's opinion on Spurs Twitter, you know, whoever's the Spurs media. Like, I think everybody has really valid points for the most part. And as long as you can back it up, you can give me some evidence. Like, I'm down to listen. So I feel like you do that. And Looking at Lonnie Walker, it's it's so strange. Again, I know I've said that a million times. It's so strange. It's it's unpredictable. It's it's hard to figure out what they're gonna do. But I think worst case scenario, it ends up being like a Malik Monk situation where, okay, you know he's been good but not great. He's got all this athleticism, all this promise, and then you're like, mm, I just can't retain him. Like I'm gonna let him walk. And so then someone like the Lakers comes along and they sign him for pretty cheap, and then he has a career year playing next to a guy like LeBron James, like. That's the worst case scenario. But even in the worst case scenario, I just don't think retaining Lonnie Walker should be the number one priority. Like you, like you mentioned, if you if you can get him for a relatively you know cheap deal, like something around the lines of what Malik Monk got from the Lakers, sure, then do it. Like a team friendly deal, do it. But if he gets something like Kyle Anderson got, then no, you let him walk. I just I love Lonnie. I still think he has some promise, but for everything that he does. He just doesn't do anything really at an elite level. And I think some of it is confidence, right? We've seen him kind of, you know, waver inside games. He sort of disappears. He's happy to just sort of be out there at times, it feels like. Like when the shot's not falling, he's like, okay, I'm just going to hide in the corner or I'm kicking the ball out. Like I don't need the ball in my hands. And that's tough. That's tough to watch. But when it's going, you know, he's he's willing to put up like 19 shots, you know, 19, 18, 7. Like he's, he'll, he'll shoot it when he feels like he's on. And so I think that's the tough thing with Lonnie is that even when he's on, there's a ton of games where he's off and he just doesn't do anything at an elite level. And I know I just said that he didn't do anything at an elite level, but it's true. <laughs> I mean, he's he's a below average mid-range shooter. He's the second worst finisher on the roster. He's not very good from floater range. He doesn't really have a floater package at all. Not a lot of touch there. And we've seen his catch and shoot three point percentage go up. Like he was one of the worst at the beginning of the season, 26% 20 games into the year. The fact that he's brought it up to 34% makes me think he'll probably finish in that 38, 39% range again. But like that's not elite, that's just good. And if you're just good, I don't think that you absolutely have to keep that guy around. Like it'd be nice to have him, nice to have a catch and shoot guy, but I just don't know. Like with Lonnie, I think a lot of people envision him with the ball in his hands, but he's not that great with the ball in his hands either. Like he makes some really nice plays, some really flashy plays, but he also makes a lot of silly turnovers at times. And, you know, I, I just don't think you can afford to take touches away from guys like Devin Vassell or even Josh Primo two, three years down the road because you think Lonnie might be okay, you know? So that's just how I see it. Yeah, and, and kind of, you know, closing my thoughts on Lonnie as well, is like for a Spurs team that doesn't need more – just okay they they don't need just they don't need more okay players like that's not the state that they're in right now so I think 
you know, like you mentioned, it shouldn't be a priority to be like, oh my God, we need to keep Lonnie Walker. Or, oh, if you, if, if they don't resign Lonnie Walker, they need to do something. That isn't to also say Lonnie's a bust either. You know what I mean? But at the same time, you kind of, I think we have to just really understand that where Lonnie is right now and, and, and just kind of where his, how his development is kind of taken here. I don't think that, you know, either way the Spurs should be hard pressed to feel like they need to do anything because he's not that kind of player. Like he's not that player that warrants that kind of deal or that kind of attention. So right now I think if it comes to that point and they need to resign him or they do resign him, I would be shocked if it's anything close to nine, 10, 11 million a year. I know some, Spurs, some Spurs fans are saying 14 to 16 million a year. I have a better shot at getting 14 to 16 million a year. <laughs> so uh, respectfully. <laughs> so no, I don't think that's going to happen. I think, yeah. And and you, and you mentioned Malik Monk. Malik Monk was signed one year, 1.789 million, or basically 1.1, 1. 1, 1. 1. 1.7 million is what Malik Monk got. If you're going to get Lonnie Walker for that, you're going to bring him back. But if you ain't getting Lonnie Walker for that, like, I'm just really curious to see what is his market going to look like? Like, I really can't, um, ima- like, I don't know. I don't know if you have any ideas on that, but I don't know what his market would even look like. Yeah, I think if I'm if I'm a front office, I probably give him somewhere around like four or five million a year for two years, or even like two three million for for a couple of years. I just I don't know what the value of a player that is really just good at a lot of things and not elite at anything. Like I think you have to 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 be able to be pigeonholed into a role like three and D. You got to be a really good defender. And you've got to be really good at shooting the three ball. Lonnie Walker has not been very good at shooting the three ball this season. And he also is, I mean, he's been a better defender. But you look at last year, they had him guarding guys like Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard. Uh, They even had him guard uh, Luka Doncic for long stretches against the Mavs last year. That didn't work out. He was graded out as one of the worst defenders on the Spurs. You look at B-Ball Index, they have the matchup difficulty rating. He went from being just outside the top 100 to now he's in the mid-400s this year. The Spurs went, okay, he's not that guy. He's not a lockdown guy, but he can lock down guys who are just sort of a guy out there. And he's done that well, but even that to me doesn't say like that's a, you know, doesn't scream 3 and D specialist. It screams to me like a guy, you know, who could maybe be at the end of your rotation, maybe, you know, end of your bench, something like that, but Love Lonnie. I will say some of the strides he's made recently are encouraging. Like he had a night where I think he shot four of 19. Obviously, that's not a good shooting night. But the fact that he was willing to keep shooting the ball, that's pretty telling because he doesn't usually do that. When he has a bad night, he usually is like, hey, I I don't want any part of this. I'm done. So I was encouraged by that. And the other thing that he's done really well recently, which he hasn't done throughout his career, get to the free throw line and finish at the rim. So if he can continue to build progress and, and, and do something for the rest of the season that is along that lines, then sure, consider bringing him back. But I think it's time to potentially move on from Lonnie unless, like we mentioned, it's it's a relatively cheap deal. Now, this is probably going to be the last topic that we talk about, and I want to wrap things up with one thing that has been on my mind probably for the last couple of weeks. And I know that neither player is available right now, so we're just kind of doing hypotheticals. But I think it may be time for the San Antonio Spurs, and, and I know I, I'm, people are probably going to roll their eyes at me, but... I'm going to go ahead and ask this question. Is it maybe time for the San Antonio Spurs to start thinking about taking Devin Vassell, moving him into the starting lineup, and potentially moving Derek White or Keldon Johnson into the second unit? You know, that's 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 an awesome question. That truly is an awesome question. Because I think one of the first episodes I did with you, right, I said, Devin Vassell needs to be in the starting lineup <laughs> and people were telling me i was crazy and, and you know what's crazy though is i actually know that's what they need to do so i wrote about um Derek white in the kind of the heat of his of his really of his slump saying that hey maybe it is time to move him to the bench i think that probably is the way to go with Derek, in my opinion and i think keldon it's interesting you bring him up too because i was thinking about him the other day and some people say he's too undersized to play the four they like him more at the three in my opinion, he's not a starting three in the NBA either. I think as a backup three, you'd like him. I, I think there he'd, he'd work, and I think him and Derek off the bench would work. But I definitely think Devin Vassell's a starting caliber player, 100%. I, I mean, if I was San Antonio, I would have done that from game one. My my ideal my ideal lineup for me being crazy was uh was Dejounte, Devin, Doug, Keldon, and Jakob. That's what I kind of I wanted to do. That's what, in my opinion, I thought was going to work best. And so I think San Antonio should definitely look into that now. You're also talking to a huge Devin Vassell guy who I think just he's so valuable to this team. 
I think the more Devin Vassell we see, the better the Spurs are going to do. So, yeah, no, 100%. I think that's what they should do. And I, I'll you know ask you this question, too. Do you think Keldon's home long term is at the three or is it going to be at the four? I think it probably should be at the three, but he probably would be equally as good at the four. I think when you look at Keldon Johnson, he's a guy who we mentioned it earlier in the show. He has become a really good standstill three point shooter, but there's only so much value to that. Like guys who shoot a worse percentage from three, but they have more shot versatility. Like they can shoot off the bounce. They can shoot off movement. They can shoot running off screens. Like those guys have more utility. They're more valuable because you have to keep track of them more. You have to chase them around the perimeter. Like Keldon Johnson, we talked about it in one of my spaces, which by the way, if you haven't joined me for one of my Twitter spaces, do it. They're really fun. Love talking to fans, but back to the topic, um, with, with Keldon Johnson, he led the league in, open or uncontested three pointers up until the last couple of weeks. So you look at that and that tells me like, they're just really not that scared of him shooting the open three. Like he doesn't take that many per game. And the fact that they don't have to chase him around the perimeter and keep up with him like that, like that just makes a defense's life easier. And we've seen as teams have started to close out to him, he's fallen into some bad habits where we know he's got that tunnel vision. He made up his mind before the drive started. He's going to finish that drive. And most of the time, he's not finishing at the rim. He just isn't. He's the worst finisher on San Antonio's roster right now. He's only finishing about 54% of his shots at the rim. That's really bad. League average is only 64%. So for me, Keldon Johnson can be a good player. He's got to become a better finisher. He's got to become a more aware ball handler. And really, like he just doesn't have a lot of versatility to his game like he's not shooting off the dribble he doesn't have a very diverse uh, dribble package he's not someone who's going to take you off the bounce he's not super shifty when he drives he's mostly a straight line driver and so like I love Keldon and I think that there's still some potential there to to be uncovered but I've said this from the beginning from when he was in the bubble like people who are ready to anoint him as the next face of the franchise it's too early It's way too early, and I think we've seen that. Like this year, people were saying, okay, well, he spent all this time with Kevin Durant and and Draymond Green, and he got to be with Bradley Beal and Damian Lillard, and he's going to come back and most improved player of the year award. Like certainly he was going to be in consideration with the opportunity that he was given, but he's virtually the same guy he was a year ago. So love Keldon, but I just think Devin has more to his game. Like we've seen Devin take more shots off the bounce this year and knock them down at a better percentage. We've seen his three-point percentage go up. We've seen his touches go up. We've seen his three-point attempts go up. We've seen his field goal percentage go up. He's become a way better finisher than he was a year ago. Only about 57% last year. This year he's closer to 65%. So I think if you're looking in the long run of things, the the starting lineup for the rest of the season, in my opinion, just just what I would like to see – is I would like to see DeJounte Murray. I would like you to have Devin Vassell at the two, Keldon at the three. I think Doug at the four is fine. Jakob at the five. And honestly, I would move, for all the stuff I just said about Keldon Johnson, I would move Derek White back to the bench. Like, he hasn't been a good catch and shoot three point shooter this season, and he looks better with the ball in his hands. So I'll give you a few stats in a second, but I want to get your opinion on that because I know I just spent a long time kind of going on a tangent here, but I, I want to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, so I agree with you 100%. We have the same start, the same players in the start line, or at least to start the year, that's what I wanted. I wanted DeJounte, uh, Devin, Doug, Kelvin, and Jakob. That's what I, I thought was best. Uh, but I agree 100%. I think uh, that's one thing with me that I was thinking about Kelvin Johnson is I actually, I'm one of those few people that actually like him at the four. But the only thing is, is like you mentioned, there's just so little versatility to his game. It's You kind of need someone in, someone from three to four needs to be really versatile in my opinion it's at least in the modern nba you need someone to be versatile on either end at that three or four spot and man san antonio kind of doesn't have that and if you're going to play devin vassell who said uh but you know pre-draft and kind of coming into the league that he feels best at the two natural at the two i think you still kind of need that and and if you're not going to get it from Keldon johnson i think as we mentioned doug mcdermott's that specialist you're going to need it from someone so i agree with you 100 percent. i think that's what san antonio needs to do and yeah, I'm off for more Devin Vassell minutes, man. For sure. Give me more Devin Vassell all day. And Derek, especially to the bench, too, not to close on that as well. I agree. I mentioned that uh, in that article that I wrote about, too, that it just may be time, man. I think that's probably what they need. They need someone like a Vassell who can do a little bit more stuff off the ball, in my opinion. Someone who's a little bit more rangy. Someone who's a little bit, who I just think fits better with that starting unit, unit in my opinion. 
Yeah, and, and I know Popovich is very against like shaking up the second unit. Like when he has a second unit that he likes, and, and the Spurs have been a very good second unit. They're top ten in point differential in the NBA this season. But I don't think that like the Spurs are such a good team that you can't break up their bench and try something new. And for that reason, I, I just I, I think you gotta move Derek White to the second unit. Like without DeJounte Murray, Derek White got to be the starting point guard, right? And he didn't play that many minutes because they were either blowing out teams or they were getting blown out. So I went ahead and looked at his numbers per 36. And of course, this is just theoretical. Like per 36 is not real. He didn't play 36 minutes per game. He only played about 27 over that stretch. But without DeJounte Murray in the lineup, per 36, Derek White was 19, 3, and 11 and a half with just two and a half turnovers per game. And like to me, he has always looked at his best offensively when he didn't have to share offensive responsibilities with DeJounte Murray. Like, we weren't really sure if that was the case because they hadn't really played a lot together. There were hints at that they may be able to work together. There were also hints that they, you know, maybe just didn't mesh well. But now that we've got almost half a season under our belts with them playing together one and two, I don't think it works that well. Like, the DeJounte needs the ball in his hands to be effective, and that's okay if Derek White is able to space the floor if he's able to be a really good cutter, if he's able to be a secondary playmaker. And like he's been a good secondary playmaker. He occasionally makes a really nice cut, but he just isn't a good three-point shooter right now. So for me, putting him into the second unit, letting him run the show when DeJounte Murray isn't in there, maybe that also sort of lowers his minutes per game, which is fine for me with Derek. I, I don't think he needs to be playing you know, 33, 34 minutes per game necessarily. But just getting him the opportunity to run the offense, have the ball in his hands, that is probably what the Spurs should be doing because that's just when he's at his best. And I don't know if he's going to be part of this long-term future. Like, he, maybe he gets traded. I would hate to see that. I've mentioned this a million times. My mom went to see you, Boulder. I'm a Buffs fan. I was ecstatic when they picked <laughs> Derek White. Like, I was so happy. But at a certain point, like, you got to put your fandom aside and you got to look at it like, does this work? And I don't know if it necessarily does. And, and he, he, you know, there isn't necessarily a timeline right now, right? The Spurs aren't on some championship timeline. But Derek White is 27. He's going to be 28. When they reach that, will he be in his mid-30s? Will he really fit with the team? So that's just one of the thoughts I have. Love Derek White as a player. Would love to see him be part of this team long term. I think he is a phenomenal defender. I think he can be a better three-point shooter. But up to this point, he just hasn't been. And we'll, we'll see where that lands him. But I thought that was a, a good sort of closing segment. Do you have any final thoughts on the San Antonio Spurs or any particular player? Because I don't want to cut you off if you, if you want to say something. No, I think I think you said it very you said it very well, especially with Derek. I think one thing I want to kind of close with, so some Spurs fans can think about, is how you mentioned you know them two not playing, not necessarily kind of meshing well together. I think that's true. But one thing I also want to mention is, I think we need to be careful, or San Antonio rather needs to be careful, with the fact that if Dejounte needs the ball in his hands, he needs to take that next step. Uh, to really be that that guy as a, as a creator, a passer, a playmaker, a scorer, I think then you can really start to get away with it. But ideally, you would think a guy like Derek would fit best. But hey, it's I don't think it, it works the best. I actually think Dejounte Dejounte could be a guy that would do better as as a second option too. So I mean, it's going to be really interesting to see. I think San Antonio uh, shouldn't be married to any of these guys necessarily, whether it's in the starting lineup or even long term. And uh, yeah, I think I think we got a, we got a really good pod in, so I'm 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 happy with it. Awesome. So as we close things out here, I'm going to go ahead and give you a chance to plug anything you want. Let Spurs fans know where they can follow you on social media, where they can find your content, whether that be football, basketball, you name it. So I'll throw it over to you. Yeah. Uh, thanks again for having me, bro. I really appreciate it. Y'all can all follow me on Twitter at d a bartonic. That's at d a b a r t o n e k. I do a lot of football stuff, like Noah mentioned. Uh, I'm going to the Senior Bowl next month, so be sure to check out all my stuff there. And uh, just give me a give me a holler. Uh, a lot of football stuff, a lot of Spurs stuff. And uh, thanks again, Noah, for having me, brother. Yeah, thanks again for joining me. And thanks to everyone who tuned in for this edition of Alamo City Limits. And for those of you listening at home, make sure to subscribe. Leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. We've got a fantastic staff of writers over at Pounding the Rock, including my boy Dame here, who do an amazing job of keeping everyone up to date with their favorite team, giving you the latest statistics, giving you the best stories. So check our stuff out. But until next time, Spurs fans, take care.